It is a great pleasure, uh, after two intriguing presentations this morning, uh, to share some ideas with you on political elites in the great transformation. But I should make you aware a part of the fact that, uh, unfortunately, my dear colleague from Budapest, Gabriel Leonski, cannot be with us today um, of one minor change. And this is for the subtitle of the presentation. I changed it to chances changes and challenges, and this is also how I want to structure the presentation. So I start with the chances of elite transformation, I then continue to the changes that occurred over time, and in the end I will cover challenges. If history is a large graveyard of political elites, as one of the much quoted authorities of the elitist school of elite theory, has once wrote, and I'm talking of course about the Fredo Pareto, the regime changes in what used to be the Soviet Empire produced lots of new corpses, lots of new graves on the cemetery of elites. The ousting of numerous communist top leaders, many apparently of whom were already beyond the legal age of retirement at the time, allowed for new forces to enter the political arena and eventually to seize power. The East European revolutions, as Timothy Gordon Ash had dubbed them, were so spectacular and miraculous because, rather unexpectedly, they reversed the whole logic of elite selection. All of a sudden, the window of opportunity opened for those groups and individuals that, during four decades of communist rule or even longer, had been excluded from access to the political elite. In this sense, the Annos Mirabilis 1989 and the years after were an unprecedented chance for new elites. One may not forget that those days, um, or that, that those were the days when actually intellectuals became presidents, just think of Václav Havel, um, when rhetorically skilled poets and writers became members of parliament and also the time, the period when high-ranking Communist Party officials mutated into fervent nationalists. There's little doubt that regime transition was to a large extent elite change and that the mechanisms of elite recruitment were reversed. The new pathways to power raised hopes for new politics and the communist office holders were expected to improve both the quality of the input of politics, and also the quality of the output of politics. That is why the Great Transformation did not only provide unexpected chances, but it also raised great expectations, certainly among the public, and to some extent even within the academic community. Despite the importance of mass protests for the unexpected collapse of communism, um, the regime changes as such and the crafting of the new political order were largely driven by elites. Political elites were key and crucial actors, not only in the early periods of transformation, as constitution makers, as designers or co-designers of a more market-based economy, or if you want it in short, capitalism, and also as those decision, as decision makers when the country's integration into European and international institutions was at stake. Therefore, I think a thorough study of elite formation and developments over time in post-communist politics seems essential for a better understanding of the Great Transformation. We should be aware that the collapse of communism was a great social experiment that provides us with a unique opportunity to, set, to test some of the basic assumptions we have on elite formation um, under the exceptional situation of, well, what was initially a political vacuum and then became the formative years of new political regimes. There are basically, to my understanding, four major topics highly relevant to elite research on post-communist politics. And the presentation, unfortunately, due to lack of time, will only be able to cover two of them. Those that I will not take care of, um, because quite some findings are actually available already on these issues, are elite circulation and elite settlements. Quite some uh, texts have been written on these topics. The topics I'm going to address are, firstly, the structural developments of elite recruitment and elite development, including processes of professionalization and institutionalization. 
And secondly, elite integration, um, which appears to me a very important topic. The first topic I will address under the label of changes, and the second one under the label of challenges. Two research questions are at the heart of the analysis. The first one is what structural features have been characteristic for elite formation processes and elite development in post-communist countries. And the second is, have different recruitment and career patterns emerged and stabilized? Or is there kind of a linear trend of convergence, making the post-communist elites more and more alike? I should make you aware of some limitations of the analysis because the empirical findings um, as was mentioned previously, are based on uh, ongoing research, and the analysis is restricted in at least three respects. First of all, I'm only looking at the subgroup of the political elites, and these are the representative elites, so these are the elected members of parliament. Secondly, data are, in a sense, very basic, if you want, and they are available also for only some post-communist countries. Um, usually the data are available for the 10 EU accession countries from the regions, plus three countries from the Commonwealth of Independent States. These are Russia, Moldova, and to some extent Ukraine. Thirdly, the presentation covers only structural aspects, um, very much against what has been announced in the abstract. I'm sorry for that. And uh, I will not focus, I will not mention attitudes um, in this presentation. Now let me start with um, giving you some ideas or sharing some findings with you on the changes, so the structural developments that occurred over time. And I do that under the heading of provisionization and partisanization. Most of the first generation of Central and East European elites happened to be political amateurs in the sense that they had no experience in public office. Neither did the vast majority of them had ever lived off politics rather than for politics, to use a barbarian term. In the course of the transformation, for most of them, politics turned into a profession, despite the fact that often enough, the involvement in the elite was rather episodic. So I would like to look at three aspects of these changes that occurred for the uh, representative elites. The first one is what I describe as social closure. The second one I already addressed is professionalization, and the third one is partisanization. And I'll start with uh, looking at social elements, mechanisms of social closure. While the access to the political elites was opened in the early 1990s to an extent that it possibly has never uh, existed beforehand in these countries, still barriers were there from the very beginning of the Great Transformation. This can be best illustrated for education. Political elites across Central and Eastern Europe, MPs and ministers alike actually, got recruited from among the highly educated. Cultural capital, usually in the, firm, in, in the form of university degrees, but sometimes also including doctoral titles um, or actually certificates from elite institutions in the respective countries, are almost a conditio sine qua non for to make a career in politics, basically all over post-communist Europe. <clears throat> Another example for the mechanisms of social closure that emerged right after the regime changes is the limited recruitment of women. So as in other sectors of society, women were among the first victims of the transformation, with only very few female politicians um, gaining access to the political elite. Both demand and supply factors are um, responsible for, for this development. Yet over time we find that women are recruited in greater numbers and we have in almost all countries in the sample um, increased female representation over time with very few exceptions. One of the most outstanding is Russia. Thirdly, Social closure, and possibly more importantly, actually, um, is to be found when it comes to the integration and representation of ethnic minorities. This is a politically um, more important and more controversial issue, I suppose. Um, and the common practice, especially in the Baltic countries, is that there clearly are mechanisms of social closure at work, which means that 
ethnic minorities are heavily underrepresented in the political elite, though not necessarily in the, among the economic elites. This is not to be found in other countries, like Bulgaria, Romania, and all the three countries from the Commonwealth of Independent States that we have in our sample. And in some of these countries, this is largely due to the existence of ethnic minority parties, which guarantee the adequate representation of those minorities among the political elite. Now move over to the second aspect that I would like to address when talking about changes that occurred over time, and this is professionalization. I will restrict myself here to only three rough indicators of professionalization. Political experience, incumbency, and then a brief look at the occupational background of representative elites. I start with the political experience that um, the representative elites had before they got first recruited into an elite position. Mostly amateurs, as I mentioned beforehand at the beginning of the transformation process, representative elites are now much better rooted, both in local politics and in their respective political parties. At the same time, we can clearly observe what is called in French the cumul de mandat, which means that usually, and it is much more common, over, has become much more common over time, that uh, representative elites hold a variety of political functions at one and the same time. Yet the political, uh, the political experience of representatives across Central and Eastern Europe, if compared to those of their Western counterparts or West European counterparts, is still much more limited, much more restricted. How about incumbency? Whereas the incumbency rates during the early and mid-1990s were extremely low, for the past 10 years, the representative elites have better chances to continue in their elite position and even to get access to more influential and prestigious positions within the political elite. On average, the same finding is true for cabinet ministers, which basically means that the duration in office has increased over time. Nevertheless, the decrease in turnover stopped around the turn of the century. And still today, with every new election, you find half of the representatives, on average, being replaced. So still today, across Central and Eastern Europe, with very few exceptions, one outstanding is uh, Hungary, face a much higher risk of deselection than their colleagues in the Western parliaments. Finally, a brief look at the occupational background of the elites. In the course of the transformation, there's one group that has lost its initially strong position, and those are the intellectual, or as Jacek Wazilewski has once called them, the politicians of morale. Those who were engaged in these discourses that formed or that were characteristic of the early periods of transformation. Moral discourses, discourses against communism, um, discourses on the founding of the new society, the new political order. Many of them came from the educational sector, teachers, professors, etc. And this is a sector from which less and less members get recruited into political elite positions. Now, who replaced these teachers and professors, so the politicians of morale? They were replaced by more technically and politically trained people. And they basically come from three sectors of society, business, politics itself, and then certainly from the higher ranks of public administration. In contrast to Western Europe, more and more managers move from the higher ranks of business to politics. So this is a very characteristic finding for many of the post-communist countries. And it illustrates, by our understanding, the close connection between business and political elites in the post-communist transformation. And to some extent, you may actually interpret it as an attempt of some parts of the business community to actually directly get involved in political decision-making, which is somewhat uncommon for Western Europe, um, where these strategies are more indirect. So you would hardly or rarely, this may be the exception of Italy, um, send 
these people straight into parliament or into government. Um, they would use rather other channels to influence political decisions. The influx of higher civil servants suggests a stronger politicization of the public administration, and this is very plausible. And finally, an ever-growing share of the representatives have worked in politics itself prior to their recruitment, mostly as members of lobby organizations or rather political parties. And that refers to the third aspect of what I will address in the second part of the presentation, partisization. Initially, many loosely politically affiliated people were in the parliaments and to some extent also in the cabinets. And in some countries you could find quite many independents. Furthermore, there was a lot of inter-party mobility and party switching during a given legislative term, but especially shortly before the elections when it comes to the question of getting re-elected. Meanwhile, all available data suggest that the time for independence and non-affiliated is basically over. And the present and future belongs rather to the parties and the party politicians. Parties have established themselves as the gatekeepers of political recruitment. Party hopping is less attractive than it was in the early days of transformation and therefore less frequent. Finally, parliamentary party groups have become much more cohesive over time. And at least in some countries, and I emphasize it, at least in some countries, not in all the countries, particularly in Hungary or Slovenia, they display very high levels of voting discipline, meanwhile, which was not the case in the early years um, and so in the early 90s. To sum up some of the key findings, well, apparently professionalization is underway, but it is sometimes and in some countries severely restricted. We can witness the emergence of both party politicians and career politicians. And often enough, these are the very same people, and they're party politicians and they're career politicians. Um, and there's certainly a much higher uh, degree of careerization of politics than there was in the early 1990s. How about inter-country differences? Well, I would argue on some dimensions, the representative elites in Central Eastern Europe are rather similar. And this is basically the case, the direction of change there is more or less the same. And this is basically the case for the social profile, the social composition of representative elites. Um, so it refers to their educational background, um, to their previous experience, to their educational training, etc. Not so much to their political vita. Strong inter-country differences exist when it comes to professionalization and also to partisanization. In fact, rather than a process of convergence, what we can observe here is a growing divergence. And technically speaking, you find this with uh, higher levels of standard deviations for most of the uh, relevant variables. In terms of professionalization, representative elites in Hungary and Moldova, to cite just the extreme examples, differ tremendously. So this is like these people are living on two different planets. I mean, they have very little in common. Now, having roughly sketched major changes in the composition and recruitment of political elites during the past roughly 20 years, I would now like to devote the remaining, yes, 10 minutes of my presentation to the performance and problems of the new post-communist elites. In other words, I will address major challenges that these elites have been confronted with and my argument here is that these challenges are directly related to elite integration. Two types of challenges exist. The first one is related to the connection between elites on the one hand and masses, or what usually is referred as masses society, the population on the other, and this is vertical integration. The second is related to intra-elite dynamics and to elite behavior, and this is horizontal integration. Let me start with the vertical dimension. And the key question here is whether the missing links, and I will give you some arguments for that, the missing links to society uh, represents something like an Achilles heel of elite development in post-communist countries. The first observation here is that we have parties and party politicians that are only weakly rooted in society. And this had a lot to do with the party formation in these countries, which was a party formation rather from above as opposed to a party development that was, uh, or that took speed from below, so from the people. So it was rather an elite project, 
um, the formation of parties. Many parties started their existence in parliament rather than uh, among the public at large. Secondly, we find a very low trust in elites and institutions in almost all the countries. All existing evidence, and just, you just need to look at the Eurobarometer to, to get some impression of that, suggests that across Central Eastern Europe, political elites are largely mistrusted and receive little support from the general public. Political elites are perceived as detached from the people, non-responses, if not corrupt. They are allegedly using their parliament or cabinet positions only to pursue their private interests rather than serving as representatives of the people. Well, this is certainly not specific for Central and Eastern Europe. I'm not arguing this way. But it seems much more pronounced than what we find in Western countries, in Western democracies. And as a result of such attitudes, voters' frustration hangs like the proverbial sword of Damocles over the heads of political elites. And this is, they can rapidly lose electoral support almost without any previous warning. And this is what happens in many of the elections, and I'll come to that in a second. Because the, the widespread mistrust then becomes visible, mostly visible at the ballot box. Declining electoral support. So the first trend here to be observed is a decline in electoral turnout. In the most recent elections, the median turnout was more than 20, 20 points lower than some 15 years ago. And there are few exceptions. And the only country where it's basically stable or even increasing are those countries where it was extremely low at the beginning, like Poland. The second trend is that politicians are frequently denied a political career. The risk of these elections for politicians in post-communist societies is much higher than in Western Europe, still today. And related is a third, what I find worrisome trend, and this worrisome trend is, um, and it has established in, in many countries of the region, is what I would characterize as government bashing. There is a trend that post-communist governments are not given the opportunity to complete, to adjust, to revise their policies as they were in office for a maximum of one term. And many, many cabinets actually didn't survive one term. But usually in the next elections, they are punished by the people, by the voters, and so there is a lot of discontinuity in, in this field. Also connected with a huge turnover in cabinet. Now I come to the second um, aspect of the challenges and to horizontal elite integration, or more precisely to the malperformance and what I consider the dysfunctional elite behavior. So this is where the other aspect was concerned with the relation between the public and the elites, now we are looking inside the elite, the intra-elite relations. First observation is we have parliamentary turnover that is caused by dysfunctional recruitment. Frequent rotation and revolving doors seem to be characteristic for many uh, parliaments of the region and cabinets alike. The continuously high turnover rates in post-communist countries are not only due to electoral swings, that's what I referred to early on, or the practice of government bashing that I just mentioned. At least in some countries, re-election is denied, not by the electorates, but rather by the selectorates, and as I mentioned, those are largely the political parties. Good examples are Croatia up until 2000, or Romania for all the period since 1990. Parties that permanently do not allow a large proportion of their parliamentary representatives to run again have, to my mind, dysfunctional recruitment processes. Well, alternatively, you could also say there is a discontinuity that can be due to elites not striving for re-election. This is another worrisome finding. Because in this case, a position in the political elite seems not to be attractive for ambitious people. And it's yet another indication of what I find to be a deficient recruitment practice. So if people only go into a political elite position in order to follow, for example, their economic interest, this is a worrisome finding. The second observation is we have in some countries what I call excessive elite competition. Even where institution and capacity building were rather successful and where elite consolidation can indeed be traced, Elite performance might be deficient because elites engage in overheated competition, thereby endangering the inner elite consent that is so bitterly needed in the double transformation. 
And the best current example for that is Hungary. And if you look at the earlier developments in Bulgaria during the beginning and the mid of the 1990s, that's another example. The third and final observation is we find authoritarian and populist practices. Horizontal elite integration is more bluntly challenged or rather threatened by such practices and the engagement in populist rhetoric. Political leaders that once democratically elected violate basic democratic norms and use non- or semi-constitutional means to increase and keep their power and to systematically disadvantage current or prospective competitors. Um, this is a heavy risk and a heavy challenge to um, the stabilization, the consolidation of democracies. To give you just some examples, the practices used by Mecha in Slovakia during a large part of the 1990s, the practices uh, by the Croatian President Tuchman until his death, or if you want a more recent example, look at what happened in Poland during the presidency and premiership of the Kaczynski brothers. I come to the conclusions and I try to, well, share some ideas with you on how we could possibly make sense of the elite transformation in post-communist societies. Well, I started my presentation with referring to the chances of elite formation in post-communist societies. Now, have the new elites, that occasionally are in fact old elites, properly used these chances for the benefit of their peoples? Well, on the, the balance sheet, it appears to me there are both successes and failures. While the enormous expectations of citizens have overall not been met by the political elites, they still achieved a great lot, particularly in the new EU accession countries or EU member countries. A rough indicator is the position of our CE sample countries in some common indicators of the quality of democracy. If you look at the Freedom House rankings, for example, all the 10 post-communist countries that are now members of the European Union score very well on both dimensions. And for a contrast, you can look at Russia. I'll, I'll be ready immediately. Um, yet below this somewhat gloomy surface, we find structural problems of elite consolidation and elite integration, some of which were addressed in this presentation. Limited and disliked professionalization, a strong interference of business in politics, a lack of responsiveness on the part of political elites, malpractice and dysfunctional elite behavior. There's sometimes large variation by countries. Hungary, for example, is a prime example of professionalization and elite consolidation. But such stability comes at the expense of social integration. Romania, by contrast, has witnessed some institutionalization. But with its rather volatile structures, it is much more typical for the general developments across Central and Eastern Europe. Russia is clearly a deviant case that only recently displays some stabilization, but where the price for the integration of the political class is a return to authoritarian politics. I skip here some comments on how this can be explained um, and just give my final uh, comment. While we, having come much closer to the patterns we are familiar with from the study of West European societies, I would argue in some respects elites in Central and Eastern Europe are still different. Only time will tell uh, whether elite convergence that has been on the way to some extent will gain speed and whether the elites in Central and Eastern Europe will manage to cope with those challenges that I try to sketch here in this presentation. What is for sure is that we will need a much closer inspection of the linkages between the structure of post-communist elites, and that was what was my presentation was on, um, and their attitudes and their political behavior. And this is actually where we lack research. So this is not a challenge for the political elites, but a challenge for us as political sociologists. And I thank you very much for your patience, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Können Sie mich hören? Nee. Und nun? Ich 
Do you want me to reply in German or English? English, okay. So the question was about the method that we used. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't want to devote too much time on, on sketching how, how, we, uh, how the whole research project is organized. Um, the data are actually from a research project which, which um, dates back uh, to, the, to the early 1990s, which started from studying the members of national parliaments um, in a comparative framework. And for that purpose, a common data set was set up. It's basically aggregate data. Um, and the variables covered in these data sets, well, they are basically the social profile of, of the representatives, their political background, some important aspects of their political careers, and some general indicators of, well, let's say, st stability uh, within the parliament. So this is the, the basis that we use. We have transferred this scheme to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, but we have somewhat enlarged it by, well, basically two ways. One, one was that we added new variables that are specific for the post communist countries. For example, we have some information on how much these people are rooted in, in the communist regime uh, in order to answer questions on elite circulation, which was a topic that I didn't address in the presentation. Um, and the second extension is that for some countries, but unfortunately only for some, we do indeed have individual data which allow us to follow the careers of individual people. Um, is, that, is that enough for <laughs> But first of all, one of the findings for elite circulation with regard to the communist regime would actually be that some members of the political mm -hmm. elite, the previous the communist elite, would actually go to business, right? Um, and this is p particularly noticeable. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this is particularly noticeable uh, for a country like Russia, for example. But directly to your question, well, it is hard to answer this question on the basis of aggregate data. Um, and, and therefore, as we have for some countries only aggregate data, um, my suspicion is that they are not actually following a real political career, but that is a rather an instrumental step. Um, we have some data on, on the Romanian MPs where we have individual data. Um, and they also did a large MP survey dating back, I think, to 2003. Uh, well, the findings from, from looking at the Romanian case are actually supporting this suspicion that it's basically an instrumental step. People from business go to politics, but they use their position in the parliament rather you know, to, to get context, to establish networks, to bring forward certain ideas that are business related, rather than that they have the actual intention of staying um, within the political elite. So, but, but I'm hesitant. This is a first preliminary finding, and it might not be possible to you know, generalize this for other countries.